always, welcome everybody. This is U.S. Rowing's webinar on sustainable uh, training for masters athletes. We're going to let the we're going to let the waiting room empty out. We have a lot of registrations for this, so I'm going to give it a fair amount of time. Uh, my name is Brett Gorman. I'm the director of coach education for U.S. Rowing, and I will be very quickly once we let it empty out. I will be turning it over to Dr. Seiler because I know that's who you're all here to see. So again, yeah, we're just I always I always just want to dive in, but we're going to give it another 30 seconds. And I'm actually timing myself to give it a full 30 um, before we get started. We are recording. So if anyone you know has to leave or um, know someone who would really love to see this, we will be posting it on the website. You know, probably by mid next week, we will put it in our, in case you missed it, newsletter. We will also put it in our next master's newsletter. So it will be in lots of different places um, if anyone has to leave. Um, but I'm really excited. I see some really great names, people I know, people from level three or people we've seen on past webinars. So thank you all so much for coming in on a Saturday. We know Saturday afternoon is often family time or you know can be a tough time um, to come in. So we're, we're really excited, but okay. Well, I think we're gonna get going. Again, uh, I'll say it again, Brett Gorman, US Rowing Director of Coach Education. I am down in Jacksonville, Florida where we are running um, high performance camps for our U23, U20 and U18 athletes. So if you hear any buzz behind me or I guess it'd be in front of me, that's what's happening. I will stay muted. And we won't, you guys won't hear from me. I'm gonna monitor the chat and the Q&A. Couple notes, um, go ahead and put things in there. Um, I will probably be waiting till the end to bring your questions to Dr. Seiler. Uh, we will be working in a brief break in the middle. We have budgeted 90 minutes. That will be our, our hard stop that we might end before that. But at around 45 minutes in, you know, wherever there's a break in Dr. Seiler's presentation, we will give a little break uh, for people who maybe wanna refresh their coffee, get a snack, use facilities, you name it. Well, I'm going to put his bio in the chat, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it right over to Dr. Stephen Seiler, who's here to talk to us about sustainable master's training. Doctor, thank you for joining us. Oh, well, thank you. It's a big honor. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into a little bit of the nostalgia here, but I'm going to first share my screen. Uh, let's see. There we go. And then you guys can give me a confirmation if you are seeing my screen. You see it? Yes. Oh. All right, great. Okay, so this is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, and it is nostalgic. I work with a lot of sports, uh, but rowing is near and dear to my heart. Uh, when I was a PhD student in Austin, Texas, I took up rowing because of a, a coxswain that kept bothering me in a fitness class I was teaching convinced me to go down to the rowing club and uh, try rowing at 5.30 in the morning one morning, and, and the rest was history. And I ended up, uh, I, I haven't been a national champion in too many things. In fact, only one thing, and that was master's rowing from, from uh, 1995. This is the team. I don't know if any of these guys are here tonight. I doubt it. I don't think they'd want to hear me. But uh, Pat McDonough and Ken Gates and Jason Savage, I think Ken now has the the concept two world record in the thousand meter on the erg uh, for 60 plus. So he's still going strong. And we had a little reunion on Zwift, or not Zwift, on Zoom a few months ago. And uh, we've gotten older. Uh, and, and that's what happens, you know, time goes by, but, but we're still trying, we're still pulling. I, I'm, I'm cycling, some of them are still rowing. And we're going to talk a bit about this a, you know, <laughs> the realities of getting older and still having that fire and wanting to train uh, and how can we do that in a, in, a, in a good way. So since 95, since that day, I, right after that, I moved to Norway and I've been here 27 years and almost all of that time, I have been studying in different ways, the training process. And I've been studying it in, on different groups of athletes, some represented here, uh, and, and there have been others as well. Uh, so, so this has kind of been my life, is a lot of sweat and lactate and, and trying to understand how it all fits together. Still trying. Uh, but one thing after 27 years I can say is that this is probably one of the most relevant questions to ask is uh, how many times are you going to train this year? Or how many times will your athlete that you're coaching train this year? Uh, and think about what is that number? What's an approximation of that number? And why is that important? Well, the reason it's important 
I just want to move this out of my way here. Yep. Is we want to start thinking about because often we we get so you know focused on the the specific workout that we do and, and exactly what is that uh, composition going to be? What's the perfect interval workout? And we forget the forest for the trees. And when you study the best athletes in the world, this is what you find out that they never talk about their epic workouts as being the key to their success. These epic workouts that may be part of their memory, they're a consequence, not a cause. They happen on the way uh, and they happen as part of a bigger picture of training where every workout cannot be epic. It's not possible. So whether you're an elite athlete or a master's athlete, the, you know, the take home message before I even begin is this, that these long-term gains that we can make, or, you know, holding fitness, if we're older, improving fitness, if we're new to the sport and so forth, they are a function of, of being able to stay with it, being able to get out there week on week, month on week, stay healthy, stay, keep the joy in the process. And those small effects, those small improvements add up. It's like compound interest. Uh, so you don't realize it until you've been doing it a while. And all of a sudden you realize, wow, you know, this account has gotten quite a bit better. And, and the same with training. So that's my number, or at least that was my number in, in uh, 2021. Went into my training diary and, and found out I trained 314 times, which was pretty much exactly what I was hoping for in terms of that I wanted to train about six days a week. That was my, you know, fairly ambitious, but it was the pandemic. There weren't a whole lot of travel and, and I, I did break a couple of ribs at one point doing something stupid, but I still managed to, to do this and I had a good season in cycling and so forth. And, and, and so this number is kind of a reflects gen, often just how have we managed the process? Have we stayed healthy? Have we avoided big periods of either sickness or injury uh, or, or stress or other life issues that have resulted in us training much, much less than we had hoped? And is this the right number? No, it's my number. You know, your number may be 180 or 500 or, you know, everyone has their, their ambitions and their life situation and so forth. Now, if I were going to, I've had a pyramid or two that I've talked about are hierarchies. And most of us that have been at the university, we probably remember Maslow's hierarchy uh, of needs. Well, this is, if I were going to talk about basic, the hierarchy of training, I would say that it starts here. That the first thing you do is just find a, a frequency of training that is sustainable for you and stick with it, commit to it, whether it's three days a week, four days a week, six days a week, but but if you make that commitment, that becomes an anchor point in the in your whole training process. So frequency is the starting point. And 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 I haven't even talked about yeah, but how long or how how hard? No, because the most important thing is getting out there. And when that habit is consistent, then good things happen. Whether it's a beginning runner, beginning rower, or an established masters athlete. And then we're going to talk about duration, session duration. So when we've got the frequency where we want it, it's sustainable. Our bodies handle the recovery that we need and so forth, or we, we get the recovery we need. Then often I'm going to look at athletes training and we're going to see that they're going to extend. Part of the developmental process is making sessions longer. This is what we see consistently in uh, the best athletes. They don't go harder all the time, but they do go longer on average in, in sessions. And then, of course, at the top of this pyramid, yes, we need intensity sometimes, some days. And so, but the hierarchy goes in that direction. First frequency, then duration, and then intensity. Now, all of us can confess to the realities that sometimes we flip this in our heads and we try to solve every problem with more intensity. And that's one thing we do not see being successful uh, with elite performers. So basically, every time you go out to work out, whether it's in the boat, on the bike, or whatever, whatever type of training you're going to do, you, you kind of are first asking this question, is today, am I going to intensify? Am I going to have a, 
intensity focus or now I understand this is not an actual word I kind of made it up but am I going to extensify am I going to extend in my head I'm trying to think about length like today I had a four hour and 15 minute cycling session for me it was extending my reach in terms of what was my comfort zone because I don't normally cycle four hours every day so this is the first question now this is kind of a summary of a lot of physiology research over a hundred years uh, and if and, and we're going to kind of use it as a as a framework for thinking about some issues related to training, some issues related to the aging process and what happens as we get older and how that might be important in terms of how we put together our own training program. But the basics of the physiology that limit endurance performance, and, any, and, and we can basically say that any, any performance that lasts from about three, three and a half minutes up to nine hours is they there's there's much more similar than there is different when it comes to the training process and when it comes to the physiological limitations so 2000 meter rowing 1000 meter uh, rowing and masters uh, these are the key issues what's your maximum oxygen delivery or your vo2 max what's the maximum amount of oxygen that you can take in and utilize during high intensity work this is dictated by two components the q is what we call first cardiac output heart rate your maximum heart rate times what we call stroke volume which is how much blood is being pushed out of the heart each beat so if you have 200 beats and 200 milliliters per beat then that would give you 40 liters of blood leaving your heart every minute and that would be a big cardiac output now the next step is this, and it's, we call it in physiology terms, fractional utilization. And there's different names for it, lactate threshold, ventilatory threshold, maximum lactate steady state, things like that. So you've probably heard some of these, probably the ones you've heard most are something about threshold, the, your lactate threshold. But what it comes down to is it's the percentage of this that you can maintain for a relatively long period of time many minutes 40 minutes say uh you know there, there's different definitions so i'm not going to go too deep in the woods here but it's basically saying what percentage of this can i maintain without starting to accumulate a lot of lactate a lot of waste products and slowly moving towards fatigue uh, and then this the third component here actually connects the engine the metabolic engine to the chassis to speed to the speed of the boat but there's both biological components to that there's efficiency associated with our metabolic function and of course there's technical efficiency and that kind of gets all wrapped up into one number when we're measuring efficiency in rowing or running or cycling and so forth uh, but it's it's absolutely a critical part of this process and then there's one little one more part that we all <laughs> have a love-hate relationship with in rowing, and that's that so-called anaerobic capacity. Uh, I don't like that name. It's physiologically kind of inaccurate, but we kind of, we know it when we see it. And, and we know that this is that, the part that is essentially very high intensity above the, the what's our maximum oxygen uh, consumption capacity. And it's kind of that little battery we have. Some have a bigger one than others, but it's that that battery we have that allows us to try to on top of already being at maximum heart rate and going all out, we can squeeze out some kind of a sprint or it also gets used somewhat at the start of a race as well. So that's obviously important in rowing is, is this component. And it's a function of your fiber type composition of your muscle, how much muscle mass you have, and something called buffering capacity, just the ability to tolerate the lactate. Uh, and, and some of that to a certain extent, obviously is trainable. So that's the big frame, that's the main framework. And obviously, if we improve any of these without making the others worse, then the net effect should be higher average boat speed, whether it's a single, double, whatever. 
so this is this is worth having in the back of our minds. Now, I want to step back from that a little bit because it's also a framework for understanding aging processes and how they impact our performance. And back in uh, December and January, December of 21 and January 22, we at my university, I, one of my students and I developed a questionnaire. We were interested in some issues related to training and, and health characteristics of endurance athletes. And so we put together a questionnaire and I use digital media to get it out and and uh, U.S. Rowing was kind enough to kind of recruit some of you. I, I think I had given a talk and, and that helped a little bit and so there were quite a few rowers almost mostly from the United States that were part of this and so this was the 1,802 athletes uh, contributed to the survey. Here's the distribution of their sports. It was cycling, uh, running, triathlon primarily but that that lighter green triangle there that's that's rowers uh, and it turned out i believe it was 182 rowers so almost exactly 10 percent of this sample was rowers um, gender unfortunately this is this is typical is that we get more men than uh, women who respond to this type of thing it's partly a function of social media also being biased towards males on twitter uh, but we did as a good a job as we could to try to increase this, and it did help. Uh, and the numbers for the U.S. row, the rowing part are actually higher. They're more like about a third female and two thirds male. Uh, but it's a problem. Uh, it's a challenge that we have in in sports and sports training is to to get a better uh, parity when it comes to the, the information that we get on the female athletes. Uh, now, this is just where they came from. Uh, North America and Europe were the primary, and it, it, the survey was in English, so obviously that has a lot to do with things. Uh, this is uh, primarily Australia. And then what, ca what categorizes your performance level? They had five categories to, to rank the, or rate themselves. They were either a recreational athlete who competed occasionally, a hardcore age grouper or master's competitive athlete, which probably many of you would put yourself in that category. These tended to be younger athletes, regional class, national standard, university scholarship, and then actual professional international elite. And of this group, 110 were actually, uh, they were getting paid to do this stuff. So, so it did, it was a survey that incorporated or, or a spectrum of uh, abilities. Now, the rowers, it was, as I said, there were 182. Uh, this is the distribution of rowers. Um, and I, I'm going to focus on the 40 plus group just because we're focused on masters tonight. Um, and this group, this was about two thirds of men and, and one third females. So that's what we have to work with. I'm going to look at it a little bit in isolation and then up against some of the data from uh, the entire survey. But on average, this is what these, this group looks like. So when I cut out the youngsters, and uh, then we had just the group that was 40 plus within the survey and they were rowers. The average for this group was uh, about 417 reported training hours per year. All that you see, there's quite a bit of variation. The standard deviation, as we call it, is almost 200 hours. So there's within this group athletes training over 600 hours and some training maybe 200 hours. Average 417. Now, this is kind of interesting to me is, you know, what we see is this breakdown about two, th about three fourths of that is, is uh, endurance activities and a fairly big percentage of it is, is non-endurance. And I'm pretty sure that's primarily strength training. And what we do see is relative to other endurance athletes in the survey, um, this distribution of endurance versus say non-endurance or strength training primarily is different for rowers. Rowers tend to do more strength training than runners, cyclists, and so forth. And, and we see that in the data. Uh, maybe a bit higher training volume in total for, for particularly cyclists and triathletes, uh, but more strength training for rowers. Now, bottom line on this, or at least one of the bottom lines, is, uh, is unfortunately I'm here to tell you that exercise doesn't make us bulletproof. It doesn't prevent things from going wrong in our bodies as we get older. 
And, and we can see this because this is a great group of, of, of masters athletes. Many of them are outstanding performers in their own right. Uh, and this is the incidence of uh, some different typical medical diagnoses. So these are diagnoses that these uh, respondents said, yes, I have been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation or I have been diagnosed with, a, with a diff another cardiac arrhythmia. I've got high blood pressure. I've got some other type of cardiovascular disease. I've got arthritis, asthma, exercise-induced asthma, allergies, or I've got some other diagnoses. So when we add it all up with overlapping and so forth, about half of all the over 40 endurance athletes, you could say, had something going on. They had a diagnosis that they were dealing with, okay? Now, some of you are already looking over here at the rowers. And you're thinking, OMG, rowing is bad for me. Look at this. The rowers have more atrial fibrillation. They've got more high blood pressure. They've got more arthritis. I knew it. You know, and, well, calm down, okay? Because one of the big differences is this. Uh, it may not make you happier, but the average age of this entire sample was 52. The average age of the subsample of rowers was about 10 years older. And that may or may not make you feel better because if you're, if you're me that's in between these two, you're thinking, well, it's kind of going all downhill, <laughs> you know, statistically speaking. I mean, the, the, but yes, this, the probability that you, you get these diagnoses kind of just increases over time. Uh, but I don't think these data in themselves are saying that rowing is more injurious to the heart or anything like that. I think this is primarily attributable to just the age difference and, and the fact that these diagnoses do tend to increase fairly non-linearly uh, with age. You know, but there may be other issues involved, but we this is just not a big enough sample to, to be able to say anything about that. But bottom line, yeah, we got stuff. I've had atrial fibrillation myself. Twice I've been uh, had to go into the hospital and go under narcosis and be shocked out of it and, uh, and so forth. So we, we all have our stuff going on, uh, but we're still, we're still kicking and fighting and taking sometimes taking medicine. Now, as part of this survey, there was also some questions we asked about undiagnosed symptoms, you know, niggles and, and things that people experience and feel during training at, at rest and so forth that may be uncomfortable or makes them think something's going on. And so here's some of the questions we asked there, same breakdown. Uh, did they just feel like they had felt an arrhythmia? So in other words, they haven't been diagnosed, but they feel that their heart skips beats or their heart kind of jumps up in their throat at rest. Well, almost a fourth of, of the over 40 said yes to that. Now, is that true for sure? Is it actually an arrhythmia? Not so clear. We have to keep that in mind, but they felt like it. They felt an arrhythmia. Arrhythmia is during exercise, which we tend to think of as more serious or more potentially serious. About 10% said that they felt like there was something going on during exercise. With rowers, numbers are a little bit higher, but again, older group. When it comes to things like I hear buzzing in my ears, now what is that? Is that tinnitus or something? I, well, similar for both groups. Sudden back pain. When I stand up, pretty much the same. When it comes to what we call orthostatic intolerance, which I, I know I deal with at, at times. In other words, you, you stand up from a chair and then suddenly you feel dizzy for about 10 seconds. This is very common in endurance athletes. Uh, some also, of not so much rowers, but athletes are do tend to be weight conscious they are trying to cut weight sometimes because it makes you faster if you're going up a hill and so forth so these issues also are present for some athletes the bottom line is is that again the, you know a lot a lot of us have something going on we've got we're experiencing things that aren't that aren't comfortable and we also ask people who they talk to when they have things like this and Unfortunately, one of the things we see is that a, a lot of people, they say, well, I don't talk to anybody as long as it doesn't affect my training. About 25% of all the respondents answered in that way, which obviously 
is potentially pretty dangerous. And it's probably, it's, it, it's more prevalent in men that they will tend to just disregard symptoms uh, until they have no choice but to say something to somebody because they're in trouble. It's, it's affecting them badly. So keep that in mind. Now, back to some physiology. So we want to talk about training. If I bring you into a laboratory, whether you're a runner, cyclist, rower, we would do the same basic kind of test. We would do some type of uh, step test or, or intermittent protocol where we would gradually increase the rowing power output on the ergometer or the running speed on the treadmill or the power on the bike. And then we would measure the physiological responses. We would measure heart rate. We would measure ventilation. We would measure oxygen consumption. We would measure blood lactate at different points during different intensities. And from that, we would construct a profile of you as an athlete. And we would identify some, some thresholds for when things begin to break, when lactate begins to increase. We often use something we call the first lactate turn point. And then we would identify what we often call the second turn point, or sometimes it's called the ventilatory threshold, depending on how you measure it. Here it's with ventilation, here it's with lactate, generally gives about the same in, uh, measurement, about the same result. This is heart rate here. So then we would be able to say, well, this athlete, uh, their first lactate turn point on a bicycle is happening at about 200 watts. So below that, they have very low blood lactate. Once they get above this, their lactate starts increasing. We can assign a heart rate to that so we can begin to establish what we would call intensity zones, right? And then we can measure VO2 max and so forth. So this is what happens in a laboratory. And because of the way the physiology works, when, the re when we do research on this stuff, we often use three intensity zones because they are something we can identify physiologically. Now, U.S. rowing, I'm sure, uses more than three. Uh, the, the Norwegian Federation also uses more than three. Uh, so sometimes we have more zones because it's pedagogically valuable, but the physiology, you know, we're more conservative, okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So if, if we think of these three intensity zones, it might look something like this. This is numbers from a lot of cyclists that we've studied. Uh, this is based on ventilation or you know, roughly you'll see something about two millimolar lactate for that first turn point, somewhere around four for the second. For highly trained rowers, these both tend to be a bit lower because there's a lot of muscle mass active at the same time. Won't get too much into that, but it might be 1.7 and, and 3.5 or something like that. Uh, but at any rate, we can identify these three zones. And then this would be VO2 max here. Okay. And if you're, if the rowing federation says, yeah, but we use five zones, well, it might very well be that you can cut this zone up in two parts. And you might also cut this one up in two parts, but these will be squiggly lines, meaning they're not, they're arbitrary. They're not based on any very specific physiological event that's happening, but they might help you if you're a coach to help say, I want you today in zone one. I don't want you anywhere near your threshold or hey, you're going to be doing these intervals and I want you just above the second threshold, but I don't want to go too deep in the well. I want to be in that zone four, about 90%. Okay. So this is, you know, we, we can use the zones to help us tune in with our athlete and help them calibrate their training. And, and of course you do the same with yourself. And we have now, of course, if you do anaerobic capacity sessions and th things like that, then there are additional zones in a lot of these uh, systems. So what's one thing that's worth asking is as we get older, because we're gonna, we are, uh, do the different components of our endurance performance machinery, do they all age or all deteriorate at the same rate as we age? And the answer is no. And this is, a, this is useful to understand because it helps us to understand performance and how we should train. So let's look at this. Now, the big three changes that happen as we get older that can fundamentally impact endurance performance are these. The first 
is that maximum heart rate gradually declines. There is no way to avoid it that we have found. It is a, it is kind of a obligatory uh, co component of the aging process. Now, it may vary a bit in different people how fast it happens, uh, how rapidly the heart rate declines, but you've often heard like 220 minus age as a little equation that might help you to know about what your maximum heart rate should be. And that's that at least is based on that reality that as we get older, as that age number increases, the max heart rate is tending to decrease. And that's true on average for the population. Now, 220 minus age is not a good population representation of that reality, but it's, it's typical. And here you see another equation. It's like about 208 minus 0.6 or seven times age. This is multiple studies have found t this kind of approximation. And it's basically the same for men and women. There's not enough difference, if there is a difference, uh, to, for it to be meaningful, for it to make a difference in how we would estimate or how we would train or anything like that. So it's, it's the same for men and women. Now, um, one thing, a take home message for you is if you don't know your maximum heart rate and you want to just guesstimate it based on one of these equations, my, my <laughs> response to you is please don't. This is data I've collected over the last couple of years from two different studies, over 4,000 subjects, um, 4,300 that have given self-report their maximum heart rate. And these are athletes that have heart rate watches that do a lot of, you know, they're very data oriented. So they're, I trust their self-report of their heart rate uh, because they're very tuned into themselves. And what you look at this, it's a cloud, it's not a line. Um, and so you, you can, on this set of data, you get about exactly that same regression equation, about 208 minus 0.6 times age as a best, what we call a best fit regression line. So all it's doing is saying, if I make a line that would be the best possible fit of this cloud of data, where does it go? And this is, you can do this mathematically, and then you can, you can uh, determine that line in the form of an equation. Um, and that's all well and good, but the reality is, is that you see there's huge variation at the individual level around that equation. And it's extremely important to understand that because you can see at any given age, the difference between, you know, at the outer points can be as much as 50 beats in, in actual maximum heart rate difference between two people at the same age. That would be, that's extreme, but it, it happens. And so if you take an equation like 208 time, minus 0 0.68 times age, and you calculate what is the predicted heart rate from that, and then you compare it with the actual heart rate that the athlete says, well, my, my actual heart rate is this, then you can develop a distribution of the, of the difference between uh, what's reported by the athlete as, as what they have seen during competitions, during their hardest workouts and so forth versus what the equation says. And this is the distribution from these over 4,000 that we've uh, collected data from in that difference. Now, if you're not used to looking at a frequency distribution, then I'll help you out a little bit. Down here, it's telling what's the, what's the spread. So this area here are all of the people whose actual heart, max heart rate versus their report of the uh, predicted heart rate were within five beats per minute. So that's a pretty, pretty decent fit. You know, if you're on the outside, I, I wouldn't be too happy with it being five beats off for myself, but it's, it's not too bad. It's not going to have a huge effect on, on how you would uh, train if you got within five beats. So about 40% come out. Okay. Uh, using this guesstimate. And then there's another group, about a third or about 30% are going to be between five and 10 beats over or under the prediction. And already there, I would say, this is enough that it's going to create problems in terms of getting intensity right. And then there's another 30% that are going to be way wrong. They're going to be more than 10 beats off, either above or below 
the, uh, the, the, the reality. So, you know, I would basically say with these regression equations, six out of 10 are going to come out uh, with a number that's just not, not, not close enough for good management of their training intensity. So that's a one I want to take you to take home with you is if you're going to use heart rate, try to get a reasonable understanding of what your maximum heart rate is. And, and again, keep in mind that your maximum heart rate on a bike versus rowing versus running, they can be different. Okay. The running uphill on a, you know, a 10% grade on a treadmill is a great way to get to maximum heart rate or on a, you know, a, a hill outside. Uh, so some people do not hit the same heart rate seated on a rowing machine. Uh, how big is the difference? Might be five, might be eight beats per minute, something like that on average. But keep that in mind. Now, another thing that happens during aging as we get older is we lose muscle mass. And preferentially or specifically, we tend to lose more of the so-called type 2 fibers, the fast fibers. So there's a general loss of muscle mass. And within that loss, there's a, a, an extra a faster rate of loss of those more explosive fibers. So you could imagine, and you probably felt it yourself, you don't quite have the same jumping ability you had when you were 20, now at age 50 or 60. Uh, some of you would say that would be a remarkable understatement, uh, in fact. And, and if we look at, this is MRI pictures of uh, thigh, 25-year-old, uh, 63 year old and you, you can see lots of these and you see the general story there's less muscle mass and there generally tends to be more subcutaneous fat uh, as we get older so the the outer the outer circumference may be the same but the force producing ability is not the same in these as we get older on average okay and this is called sarcopenia uh, from the Latin, uh, you know, flesh poverty. Uh, so you'll hear this term among the fancy age, age, uh, science, aging scientists. Uh, they're aging, but they're studying aging is what I mean. It is important to remember, though, that even though this picture looks like it could set, be that muscle is becoming fat, that's not happening. It's not, you know, you don't turn muscle into fat. Uh, but just some different processes are happening at the same time that tend to go in the direction of two different things happening. One, increase fat, two, decrease muscle mass. So obviously both of those are going to contribute to lower power output relative to your body weight. Now, here's an example of a study where this is about 30 years old, but it's still relevant. This was on females, but the data is the same for males, is what we see is that uh, if we look cross-sectionally, this is 30-year-olds, 50-year-olds, and 70-year-olds, we see uh, a decline with age, but that decline tends to accelerate after about 55 years old. And that's really great for me because I'm 56, so it's something to look forward to, uh, is that I'm going to lose muscle mass faster from now from here on out particularly if i don't do anything about it and what we also see is that along with that drop in muscle mass there's a drop in force that that lines up quite well with the change in muscle mass okay so less muscle less force peak force but if we look at force relative to muscle size that stays the same so that is What's happening as we get older is we're, we're, we're losing the quantity of muscle, but the quality of the muscle, at least the force, the, the maximum force producing ability is the same per unit of muscle, okay? It's, it's less explosive, but absolute force is the same on average. Uh, so, so that's some good news is now if we can do some work to to slow down that loss of muscle, then we, we, we achieve some good effects. And then the third big issue that aging people will often be able to, to, to write under, you know, to, to say, yep, I've been there, 
is that we lose elasticity in the tendons. And worst case scenario, probably the, the worst and, and, and very common injury is the Achilles rupture. Uh, getting out there on the basketball court, the volleyball court or whatever, you haven't been playing that much, but you, you remember your good old days and you can hear the sound of the Achilles rupture. It's not a pretty sound. I've been on the court when it happened. Uh, and, you know, it is just one of those, it's old boys injury. Uh, that will tend to happen. Um, and, and these tendons, they just structurally, the, there are changes at the microscopic level and they have less elasticity and they are stiffer and they are more likely to, to rupture uh, with sudden movements and so forth. Uh, it's just, unfortunately, it's a very common part of the reality uh, for the aging athlete. So if you're gonna get out on the court, you know, relive your old days, you need to remember that you need to build up to it gradually. Don't get out of a rowing boat, you're training five days a week, just rowing and suddenly get on a court. That is an invitation for disaster. If you haven't been, you know, maintaining that, some of that fitness and, and adaptation of this, of the tendons and so forth. So um, that's, that's the big three that we have to think about. Now, if we're studying aging uh, as scientists and, and we want to study athletes, master's athletes, and say, what's going on with our master's athletes? There's, there's three approaches. One, we can recruit master's athletes and just divide them into age groups and then look at the differences between the age groups. This is just what we call cross-sectional approach. Another approach is that we can recruit master's athletes and then match them with younger athletes that have a similar performance level. So you got a 50 year old that's running a 10 K in 40 minutes. And then you have a 30 year old that's running a 10 K in 40 minutes and you match them up and you compare them. Well, the problem with this approach is that the relatively speaking, the older athletes are actually better performance, better performers. So the matching is matching them on an absolute level, but it's actually mismatching them on a relative level. And often they are training much more relatively speaking. And then the third way to do this, which would be the gold standard, is just find a group of young athletes, measure them, wait a few decades, measure them per periodically every five or 10 years, and keep doing that for a long time. Now, you can imagine that's a nice way to go, but it is not particularly good for your career as a sports scientist. You're not going to get much published waiting around years and years and years for people to just get old. So this approach is not done very much. There's a few studies like this, but not many. So we tend to do this. And here's an example. This is master's level cyclists. They were broken up into three age groups, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, and then above 55. Now this is an open category. So this turns out to be a little bit tricky because uh, as you'll see this, this, the average age of this group here, we got 39. 10 years older here, 49. And now this group is actually 15, 16 years older on average. So, so it's a little bit misleading, uh, but you see in general, <laughs> a shrink in height. Uh, that's for different reasons. The weight is about the same, right? Weight may be going down a bit, losing some muscle mass, body fat's going up a bit, you know, so it's, it's kind of the, the realities on average that we're already expecting. But this group, these groups are, are kind of matched, at least for days a week of training, five days a week. Ours, this group is actually training more. And, and we see that, <laughs> you know, once you get my age and your kids are grown, uh, you actually have more time to train. And so a lot of times we have some, you know, super, super masters types that are training quite a lot. Now, so if we take these three groups and we look at them uh, based on that, what I was talking earlier about, let's look at VO2 max first. Here's the, the relative youngsters. I got 61 mLs per kg, goes down about 10% in that decade from, from 30s to 40s. And then we, we go much farther down to about, by about 25% in that next jump. But we have to remember that's a 15 year uh, change. Their max heart rate is going down. Just as we said, it's, it was on average 185 in this group. It's down to 160 in this group on average. Now, if we get a little bit 
more correct in how we look at heart rate and, and factor out resting heart rate. Here, I've had to just use an estimate of heart rate rest at, at about 50. So it's not perfect, but it makes the, the, the decline more physiologically calibrated to the realities of oxygen consumption demand. And then it goes down a bit, it, it, the, the, the actual decline in heart rate reserve, but it matches up quite well with the decline in power output that they're able to achieve. Now this is cycling, but you could imagine it could be on a rowing machine. Okay, the average power on the C2 or something. And you see that it's, it's, you can, you're fighting pretty well in that decade, but then you get into your, your, your late 50s and 60s. Yeah, power is going down. Now work economy is the same. Remember that was one of those components. So the relative economy or efficiency is still the same. It's not getting worse with age. And the other good news that's worth looking at is that the threshold power as a percentage of your max heart rate is actually will tend to go up. That means that the muscular adaptations, the endurance of the muscle is not going down. You're losing a bit of muscle mass, but the, the mitochondria, the capillaries and so forth, they're staying the same. So there's very little change in that first, that first lactate turn point relative to VO2 max, it's, it's staying, the, the absolute capacity is, is staying about the same. So as a percentage of your lower VO2 max, it's actually better. Uh, and, and so what we see relatively speaking is that aging veterans will tend to in, in, want to go up in distance. They will tend to feel like they race better. They're still more competitive at longer distances, not the shorter distances because they're losing, they're losing the anaerobic capacity, they're losing some muscle mass, they're losing their VO2 max a bit, but if the, for longer events, the decline is, is relatively smaller, okay? And that's why distance runners tend to go up in distance as they get a bit older. They go up from the 5K to the 10K, to the half marathon, to the marathon, and so forth. Uh, and you probably feel a bit of this in your rowing training as well. Now, here's a little bit more, you know, you can use this matched approach where you match a master's athlete with a performance matched younger runner. Here you see some matching that was done. 72-year-old master's athlete matched with a 28-year-old, and it's based on their 10K time. Now, these are not world-class athletes by any stretch, uh, but they're matched for performance. And then so we can then go in and look at them and say, well, once we match them for, 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 for performance, and then we can also compare them with younger runners who are just better. Okay, so he, these are just faster runners by quite a few minutes per, for a 10K. And then we can go in and look at the physiology. You know, well, of course, the young fast ones, they just have a lower, lower body fat. They've got a higher VO2 max and so forth. Uh, but the, the, the master's athletes who are well-trained, it, you know, they're pretty solid. They're, they're maintaining quite a bit of their function, um, relatively speaking. And if we go in and look at muscle, we see that these master's athletes, relatively speaking, may even be better. They have more capillaries. They have, you know, they have higher uh, enzymes for mitochondria. So relatively speaking, they are better than these younger athletes for in terms of their they've in a way compensated for some of their decline in maximum heart rate and so forth with better adaptations at the peripheral level down at the muscle. They've been training longer. They train hard. They train a lot of hours. And so they make up some of that gap with uh, just better adaptations at the muscular level. So take homes here before we take a break. Uh, your, your maximum oxygen consumption declines with age. Not much you can do about it. Uh, you know, there's a few super athletes that have been found that seem to seem to defy the aging process up, up to at least around 40, 42, but eventually things do happen. Uh, and most of this is because heart rate declines, maximum heart rate goes down. We lose some explosive explosiveness in the muscle and it's pretty hard to avoid that. Uh, but in terms of muscle mass, we can actually uh, at least slow down that decline with, the, with strength training. The endurance of, of our muscles is well-maintained. If we keep training, 
they are you know a 70 year old muscle is just as capable of building up mitochondria and capillaries and so forth as a 30 year old muscle so that's good news that's why this is in green uh, so bottom line then is that we tend to find that maximum endurance capacity is going to decline faster than submaximal and then that just means short races which masters athletes tend to do you know these thousand meter races that's really the toughest situation for us from an age perspective or from age related decline in performance those thousand meter races uh they kind of i they they stab at our weaknesses whereas if we're racing over longer distances the decline is less noticeable it, it goes slower and we hang in better against the youngsters uh, so that's that's that bottom line so with that i say that we take a break five, we'll say five minutes according to my watch it's 10 minutes to the hour or nine so we'll be back in five how's that sound awesome all right we'll see everybody at as we'll say four till at four till all right all Thank right you. See you back yep. soon. Okay, I hope everybody's back. Uh, I had a chance to get a cup of coffee. So we're going to talk about training now. And, you know, in this case, I've used a bicycle uh, ergometer, but it could be any, it could be a concept two or whatever. Anytime we train, if, especially if we're out in the boat, we're training the brain, we're training the heart, and we're training the muscle. And it's almost impossible to separate these. It's not like you say, well, today I'm just training my heart with interval training. Doesn't work that way. Uh, the brain's always involved. And so motor pathways are always, you know, the technical neurological pathways are always being developed either correctly or incorrectly, but they're being developed. Uh, and so this is always happening. And the other thing that we understand more and more is, is that when we train, we both do create a stimulus for adaptation we're, we're, we're literally kind of molecular biologists because we're, we're creating these signals that cause various proteins to be synthesized like mitochondria and so forth. Uh, but along the way is also coming stress. The body is being stressed by the process. And so there's a, there's a negative side to training. And, and we understand this kind of implicitly if we've been doing it for a long time. So well, a lot of my research is about this is, well, okay, what can we do with the way we train to try to get more of this and less of this, or at least a, a, a manageable amount of stress for a maximum amount of, of stimulus for adaptation, and because both are going to happen. You know, there's going to be muscle damage. There's going to be inflammation. There's going to be uh, the autonomic nervous system is going to get stressed. There's going to be a suppression of our immune system and so forth so we have to manage this while trying to get the most of this that we can uh, and this is an optimization problem it's not a maximization problem meaning you can't just beat it with doing more you can't double down on intensity or so to, to solve the problem you have to figure out what is what is a way to optimize this and find this balance. And this is basically what our athletes have been figuring out for many decades through trial and error. And we can benefit from their expertise or their, their accumulated knowledge. And so again, it goes back to this. A lot of the questions that we have are, are about how do we integrate or how do we balance these two components, both intensity and the duration of exercise, uh, help to signal adaptation okay it's not just intensity it's also going longer that also increases the adaptive effect or the 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 training effect of a training session but we have to figure out how to use them appropriately all right and and i've talked about kind of again this hierarchy of training priorities a little bit more in detail on the details of training and the, the most important components of the training process are the least, what should I say, the least sexy, to be honest. It's, it's all about getting it done. It's all about being able to train relatively frequently. 
It's about being able to do some high intensity training and it's about getting the intensity distribution, right. And the research shows that when you do that, these things, well, then a lot of good things happen that, that, that you, the details are not as important as we would make them out to be. For example, the very specific periodization models that people use and so forth. The research supporting this is very modest in terms of how much it makes a difference if you're doing the big things right. And then, of course, at the top of the pyramid, if you're a high performance athlete, if you're competing at altitude, if you're competing in the heat, then yes, preparing for that is extremely important. You know, I'm a cycling guy. I'm going to be in Copenhagen for the start of the Tour de France. It's going to be hot. It's going to be a hot tour, almost certainly. And the athletes that aren't prepared for that, in addition to the fact that they'll be at 2000 meters of altitude, they will fail. And so, yes, they are preparing for that reality. Uh, but that doesn't matter if this is not well done. If they don't have the base, then it's not going to matter if they do heat acclimation, if they're just not fit enough. And then, of course, you've got things like pace, race pace training and getting the taper right, you know, uh, resting into a competition appropriately and so forth. Yeah. That matters if you've done the big stuff right first. And on top of this, or, or this sits on top of something that's even more important, for, for especially, or not especially, but for all of us, and that is that we got to stay healthy. Uh, that if, if your physical health, if your mental health is being compromised by the training process, then the whole, the whole, house of cards crumbles uh and 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 we know that when the foundation cracks it 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 has up over effects and that's the that's the reality for the training process as well because you can't separate the mind and the body they are intrinsically connected and when the mind is under stress and stress comes from different sources then the physical response to training is also compromised uh, it's a fascinating reality that the, there really is a brain body connection. And so we, when we train and when we coach athletes, uh, we can either train and coach them in a way that tends to protect this foundation or in a way that tends to tear it down. And we probably all experience this. And then you add up, you add this training issues on top of things like work stress, things like infections that we've learned to be very sensitive to recently, relationship stress, sleep, nutrition, injuries, parenting stress, and parenting stress that can be both perceived by young athletes, their parents are stressing them out, but it can also be the stress of being the parent of those youngsters uh, so we both, we've pretty much all been on both sides of that. Um, and of course we're getting older and our ability to handle certain things, our, our time to recovery is getting longer and so forth. And if we're not, you know, we can deny it, but it doesn't make it go away. So these are the realities. And if we don't get these things reasonably right, if we don't get some sleep, if we don't get, you know, eat reasonably well, then it's not going to matter how fancy your training program is. It's not going to be successful uh, because you've got to have a platform of health in order to make these things, uh, you know, these adaptations for them to be sustainable and for the training process to be sustainable. Now, rowing, we uh, one of the first studies that I was involved in that really kind of was pretty important in terms of my own work on training intensity distribution was this study, uh, which I did with a guy named Oka Fiskestron had a big, he's got a long background in Norwegian rowing. And so we identified uh, international medal winners from different decades, 70s, 80s, and 90s at the time. And we had their height and their weight and their VO2 max in liters per minute. And what you see immediately was that something changed from the 70s to the 80s, because these were they were all medal winners and, and they were, uh, you know, relatively speaking, as good, the, the 70s athletes as the 80s. But from an absolute perspective, these athletes had a greater aerobic capacity. Okay. Uh, well, 
why uh, was it better recruitment it's hard to say but what we do know is that the way they trained changed quite a bit from the 70s to the 80s and this was a time when the we were kind of starting to get an understanding of the physiology of rowing and that even though the the competition duration was maybe only six minutes uh, or even down in the in the five minute range five and a half five forty five for an eight that the the aerobic demands were dominant they were the most important not the anaerobic demands and so as that understanding changed so did the training in the sense that more there were more endurance work and less high intensity work it was literally a reduction in high intensity work and an increase in the aerobic work from the 70s to the 80s and then in the 90s it just continued in that direction and, and today we see the same thing and so this change corresponds pretty well with this change uh, we can't say it's causal but it does seem consistent and, and and this has been part of the picture ever since is that i don't even if it's a short if it's a short event four minutes six minute competition duration it, the basic endurance component is extremely important and when we look at the training of the best performers now this is uh, a two-time gold medal winner in the single is olaf tufta for some of you will be familiar with he's he was in seven olympics uh, in total so he did manage to also be in tokyo uh, with, but didn't medal uh, but this was from a gold medal year either 2004 or 2008 uh, 1041 total training hours 598 sessions these are rowing kilometers, which probably are not that high, but he did a lot of other things like skiing uh, to, to beef up the volume. Hours per week, about 22. Uh, but what you see is nothing too fancy on what we would call the periodization. It wasn't big fluctuations. This January value of 120 hours was mostly because he was at altitude and doing a lot of skiing, not, not actually rowing. Uh, but in general, just a lot of volume, getting the training done. And here, this is, uh, this is competition, technique training, strength training, and the blue is endurance. So mostly endurance training, but yes, he was a big fan of strength training. So he did quite a bit of strength training. Uh, not all rowers do. And there's been very many, you know, there's been highly successful elite rowers that have not done much strength training. And there's been highly successful elite rowers that have and have sworn by it. So just so we're clear on that, it, it goes different directions there. Uh, but if we take, if we look at the intensity distribution of this athlete, it's very typical of what we've seen for elite performers is a lot of that aerobic, low lactate training, you know, 18 strokes a minute, whoosh, whoosh, lactate 1.5, 90 minutes, and so forth. A lot of those workouts. And then some, what we tend to see also is that during the rowing season that the high intensity component becomes more intense as the season progresses and we might say that the training becomes more polarized the easy stays easy and the hard sessions become more more and more race pace or race specific uh, and they also include some racing although rowing has very few races at the international level compared to most sports and if we just chop off the high intensity component and look at it in isolation, the sessions that are at threshold and above, then this is what this athlete looks like. And this is also pretty typical is that you see a kind of, you know, some threshold sessions and then starting to do some zone four work and then some very high intensity work starts coming in. And then now we're in the competition season and there's a considerable component of what we would call zone five or you know, they're getting pretty darn close to maximum heart rate, VO2 max, and so forth. Those are include races as well. And these are typical workouts in these zones that these high performance athletes will do. And it's, it's duration heavy, you know, six times 10 minutes. This was, this was a bread and butter workout for Olaf Tufta. He did it 27 times, for example, during one of his Olympic gold medal years. Uh, so it was just almost a, a reference workout. Uh, six times 10 minutes at about 92 percent of heart rate max uh, so cranking you know uh, but you're accumulating a lot of minutes and he did this much more often than he did this the the the, the really high intensity so this was more the bread and butter training because 
a slight reduction in intensity allowed for a big increase in total, uh, you might say total signal. And, and whoops, and so this, here's, this is another Norwegian athlete. She's had five world records in, in running. Her name was Inger Christensen, or she is, her name is, she's still alive. Um, and this is data from her collected by Espen Tunnison, preparation period, competition period. And you see the same basic picture that a lot of low intensity running, a lot of volume. And then as the season comes in, we start to see that the, the, the easy stays easy or even, you know, even gets easier, but the hard sessions get even more race pace, race specific. So this is a world record year, you know, a year of training for this athlete during a year that she set a new world record. And so it gives you a decent you know, picture. And this is very typical, some decrease in volume into the competition season, and then some increase in intensity, but the easy has to stay easy. Okay, that, that is a, what we very typically see. You cannot start compromising and pushing this green into the yellow zone. Then they fall apart. So out of all this has come this 80-20 distribution that I started talking about uh, you know, coming up on two decades ago. Um, and, and I would describe it to you as guardrails. Just like if you have, you're going down a windy road that's you're heading downhill and it's got sharp swings, the government will be kind enough that they will set up guardrails so that you don't go flying off in a curve uh, because of your own uh, failure to negotiate the curve. And in the same sense, these, you know, having a basic intensity distribution that we have shown that is, is sustainable, that it is effective, it's, but it's not a, a straight jacket that every athlete has to do exactly the same thing, but it creates these guardrails that keeps, it kind of protects us from our worst, uh, our worst uh, tendencies. We tend to, you know, let inertia take us. We tend to, if we're inexperienced, we will tend to just try to pull harder uh, in the workouts and hope that that solves the problem. We will tend to have egos that get in our way that we will have trouble letting someone row past us, you know, on a day when we're doing actually uh, an easy row, but they're doing intervals. It will still get at us. It happens on the bike. It's called half wheeling. And we just let things get out of hand. And then the, the intended workout intensity uh, falls away and we forget and our egos get the best of us. And this is a very typical training mistake. And it's not sustainable. And then, of course, these it does protect us. This basic uh, framework protects us from unforeseen problems and so forth. So uh, it's not a straitjacket. It's not something that people, I say, you, you know, if you don't do 80-20, if it's not exactly that distribution, it's just not going to work. That's not what we're, trying, what we're trying to say is, but we are saying that what we've seen that so many athletes from so many sports migrate in that direction and when we do research to look at does it work for uh age group athletes who are training five to ten hours a week the answer is yes it makes a difference because at that in in that volume range that's where we tend to make a lot of mistakes we tend to train too hard we tend to let every workout become kind of a middle a middle hard or pretty hard workout so 80 20 of what what 80 percent of what 20 percent of what there's still questions about that and so if i give you an example here's a here's a workout it's uh five times uh, eight minutes with two minutes recovery this was actually in a cross-country skier it was uh at altitude and she's world class so so for her you know her, her <laughs> this is a very high blood lactate uh, for her uh, she's got a super high, you know, this is a gold medal winner. Uh, but when she does this workout, this is what it might look like based on heart rate, got to warm up. And then here's first, second, third, fourth, and fifth session or fourth bout at, at, of eight minutes. And we can then quantify this workout in different ways. We could use our heart watch and we've set up our zones. I'm sure some of you have done that. And then we could say, well, what percentage of the workout was in zone one and two and three and four and five and so forth. And we get a distribution of the zones. 
Uh, problem with that is, is that heart rate kind of lags behind, and so it can underestimate the high intensity component. Now we can we can make up for this by using what we call modified time and zone, and just say, well, if the prescription was five times eight minutes, then that means that this this athlete accelerated up quickly, and then was doing about they were doing forty minutes of high intensity work. So let's just say it was forty minutes instead of basing ourselves on the heart rate response, which is kind of delayed or catching up with the work. And then a third way to go, which we kind of created when we were trying to get a handle on this, this issue, was we just called it session goal. And we said, look, you, you do a warm up, yes, and you do a cool down, but what matters is the, the, the main part of the workout. And so if you, if you factor all this in, it can be misleading. So what we just said is, well, if it, if it zone three was the key goal, or meaning in a three zone model, and it was the goal was to be up there and to get minutes in that high intensity, then this was a zone three session. And so we're going to put it in the high intensity bucket uh, in terms of uh, where it belongs in the accounting of how many hard sessions we've had that week and how many low intensity sessions. And so when we, we had athletes come in, these were uh, runners, distance runners, orienteers, and we had them do four different kinds of workouts. After we had tested them, we knew their VO2 max and so forth, and we knew we kind of had them calibrated. Then we had them do either an easy 60-minute run or an easy two-hour run or a threshold session uh, or a typical high-intensity interval session. And these are the physiology, physiological numbers for the athletes. In the one case, these two-hour runs, they did outside, so we didn't measure VO2 here. But otherwise, we've got good data on lactate, on their perceived exertion, on the Borg scale, and so forth. So you can see what they look like. And, and they would tell us, yeah, these, these workouts, I feel better after I'm finished than I did when I started. So they were very comfortable, very low lactate, very low perceived exertion, and so forth. And then you see the threshold sessions are getting close to about 90% of uh, heart rate max. Blood lactate's about three millimolar, perceived exertion about 14 on the Borg scale, for those of you who have used it. And then you've got, you've got the high intensity. So this, this is very typical numbers. So then we were interested in, well, what, how, how quickly do they recover after these workouts? And then we used what we call heart rate variability, which is kind of a window into the autonomic nervous system. And here, what we found was, is that when, when they did these low intensity, you know, extensive sessions, their, their heart rate variability or their parasympathetic, their recovery modus uh, uh, function came back very quickly. In fact, it would almost, it would almost overshoot. There would be a rebound where they would be, have higher heart rate variability within 15 minutes after the workout than they had before they started the workout here and but as soon as they got up to threshold intensity or above then the heart rate variability recovery the recovery of that autonomic nervous system was was very delayed and very different but and we also saw that high and high performance athletes recovered faster than lesser trained athletes from these high intensity sessions but there was a clear distinction is once you got above threshold things changed the stress of the session was bigger and so this was pretty important to us, and it's been repeated in different studies. And, and here it is, looking at the elite performers versus just the trained performers. And after a high-intensity workout, how quickly does their autonomic nervous system recover? And you see that the elite performers just recover faster. Now, why? Is it because they are genetically gifted, or is it because a lot of training has improved their recovery ability? That's, that's a bit of a chicken and egg question that we can't answer decisively, uh, maybe a bit of both. But what we clearly see is this is part of the training process. Part of being a high performance athlete is the ability to recover fairly rapidly from these tough workouts. And, and that allows them to train more. Uh, if I can recover faster, then I can do a higher frequency of training. So 20 years on, and to you, I would say that if I'm organizing my training 
and I do with myself, I'm going to think in terms of these two, basically two zones. I'm going to think of a low stress zone and a high stress zone. And a lot of my workouts, most of my workouts are going to be extensive and low stress, meaning I'm not going to be trying to trigger that big stress response. Heart rate's going to be reasonably low. If I'm running, I'm going to be able to talk to the person beside me. If I come to the dinner table right after training, I'm going to have a good appetite and so forth versus those high stress sessions, which are the, you know, the intervals, the, the tough threshold sessions and so forth, where I expect to be extra fatigued after I expect that I will need more recovery time. I will need a couple of days to recover from this workout. Whereas the low, low stress sessions, I should be able to recover within 24 hours. If it's going to be sustainable, if my workout system is going to be sustainable and I'm training most days of the week, then that tells me that most workouts need to have a 24 hour recovery clock or else I'm going to fall behind on the recovery over time. All right. High set, high stress sessions. As we get older, they may take two, maybe even three days to recover from. Okay. So that has to be factored in. And most of us are not going to be able to handle more than a couple of those per week over time and, and have it be sustainable. And as we get fatigued, if I do this again, that threshold intensity, as we get fatigued, it actually gets worse because it's, it's, it's fresh fruit. It's, it's a dynamic process. And as we're doing tough workouts, we're, we're literally our uh, virtual VO2 max, our virtual threshold power is actually going down during the workout, especially these long, tough sessions. So uh, that's an important aspect of understanding how this works in practice. That, that workout that starts here, if it goes long enough, it can end up here. Meaning it goes from being what was supposed to be low stress it becomes a high stress session. And here's an example. I did this for you today. Well, not really just for you, but I, I got up this morning, got up about six so that I could get my act together. And at eight o'clock, I was on the bike uh, on Zwift with 35 other people. And we did a four hour and 15 minute ride at a pretty decent pace. And I made a commitment to myself that I was going to do good body management. So I was using some carb, uh, carbohydrate uh, drinks and, and, and gels, and I was drinking plenty. I ended up drinking six, six bottles. Uh, I had five different fans blowing on me. So I was, you know, it's pretty warm here right now up in my loft. And I was, ab I was able to keep my body weight within uh, one kilo uh, from start to finish. So I did pretty good body maintenance. This is, this is the shirt I was wearing. I'm actually wearing a wearable to test out ventilation measurements. This is salt. <laughs> so it gives you an idea of the sweat process. And even though I did a very good job of body maintenance, what you're going to see here is this, the, the, these are 15 minute intervals that I broke the workout up into. And this is power, but the red line is heart rate. And I've calibrated it as a percentage of my, what's called my heart rate reserve, just heart rate max minus resting heart rate. And what you see is that initially it's nice and connected to my power output, but this was a one sprint and that kind of added to the issue. But, but overall, this is very typical response that after a while, after about an hour and a half or so, I start to see what we call cardiac drift. And now my heart rate is going up at the same power output and my perception of exertion is going up. It's getting tougher and tougher to keep holding that same power as, as the duration gets longer. Now we don't do too many four hour rowing sessions, but some of you may be doing some cycling. You may be doing some running. And if you do 90 minute rows, that can also be enough. You'll see this, you'll see this cardiac drift in your workout. And it's, it's, indication of that there's no such thing you're having to recruit more of those fast twitch fibers that produce more lactate and so forth during the workout 
So part of your body maintenance is, is this work is, is taking care of your body during long workouts, but also it's knowing when to stop for the day, knowing what, when is, when is enough, you know, for me, four hours is enough. Uh, I handled it pretty well. I'm speaking to you today. I didn't faint or didn't, you know, I'm, I didn't have to stay in bed the rest of the day or whatever. I handled it fine, but probably another hour would have been too much for me. You know, a five hour session would have had me pretty deep in the well, uh, and maybe would have made it tougher for me to recover and feel good at nine o'clock at night talking to you. So if we take this conceptually and think, you know, Steven is used to two hour workouts. I do a lot of just about two hour workouts. You probably have an idea of how, how long your typical rows are. And so for me, two hours on the bike, that's typical. Okay. So I'm adapted to that pretty well. And if I only go for an hour, then I'm, and I did that for weeks and weeks, I would lose adaptations. Okay. I would become relatively speaking detrained because I wouldn't be getting the benefits of that additional hour here. Now, if I go longer than usual, this might give me a better stimulus for adaptation. And so I'm going to do that. Sometimes I'm going to do extra long workouts sometimes, but it does come at a cost because there is more stress. There's more glycogen depletion. There's more dehydration. There's more uh, fatigue and, and damage to muscle and so forth. And that fourth hour gets even tougher. Now, I showed this previously and I made this red. And the reason I changed it to orange for you is that my perception of myself is that over the last few years, I've gotten more durable. I handle today. I felt really good in my fourth hour. And I was like, oh, this is not bad. And I even did some quite high intensity effort at the end after four hours on the bike. And I was able to do it pretty well. So I, I got the impression, okay, I'm, I'm still adapting to doing these workouts. I'm getting more durable. I'm handling this fatigue better. And I'm able to bring to, you know, come to that fourth hour in a race or a ride with more in my tank. And that's good. That's part of the training process. So if I were going to assign stress points to this workout, it might look like this. Whereas a few years ago, I would have said maybe this was 120. But today it didn't feel like it was that much bigger. I, I, I had I handled it better. And, and when we look at workouts, now here's a workout at an intensity for me is quite manageable. My maximum heart rate is only 167, but my resting heart rate is 36. So if I do a low intensity workout for a couple of hours, then my heart rate should stay pretty darn flat. And it generally does if I'm not really fatigued. But if I go up around my threshold, and you can imagine this, you know, this could be rowing power, then you'll start to see this drift, the cardiac drift. So, so often one of the indicators, if you want to know whether you're in, in that green zone, it should be that you should not see a big change in heart rate. You shouldn't see heart rate just drift up, up, up from the start. If, if it is, then you're probably your intensity is too high or you're having to exercise in extreme heat and your body's just not able to get rid of the heat. And then you're going to be in trouble no matter what. And, and, and I say that to, to make this point is that rowers tend to be big bodies. They tend to be, you know, among the endurance athletes, they are going to be the athletes with the biggest machinery, the biggest challenge to get rid of heat, because the bigger your body is, the more, volume you have relative to your surface area, which means it's tougher to get rid of the heat. Those, you know, these hundred kilo guys, uh, and, and, and 75 kilo female athletes, they, it's tough on them in the heat. It's tougher for them than it is for a smaller athlete because of physics, because of just the volume to surface area relationship. And if you're inside doing ergo sessions, even in the winter, and everybody's breathing hundreds of liters of air and it's getting humid as can possibly be, it's getting hot and you don't have fans, then you're going to be compromised. And so one of the first things I would say to any athlete like this is, Hey, during the winter, make sure you got fans going, make sure you've got air moving so that your sweat system, your evaporative cooling, all of that, that your body has developed to, to deal, to help you deal with heat so that it can work because it cannot work 
if the sweat that comes on your body just drips to the floor. Basically, you can say that any sweat that lands on the as a puddle of water under your ergometer is wasted sweat. It did you no good. Because the only way it cools your body is if it evaporates from your skin. That's how we cool the body. The sweat evaporates. If it drops on the floor, waste. Okay? So that's just the, the ventilation preaching to you. Because I think rowers are probably pretty bad at this. Now, uh, durability, I'm going to talk a little bit about. We... I've said that it can get better. This is from uh, a study we, we did recently where we kind of introduced this term is that one of the things that happens and one of the things that can definitely happen and even in an older athlete is we can become more durable that using those extensive workouts and so forth, we just handle the fatigue better. We don't fatigue as fast. We handle longer workouts better. And this gives us the potential then also to handle tougher training, which can make us be able to also go faster and do the high intensity component as well. Uh, and, and we do see differences. Some athletes have a lot of, uh, they, they stay very stable. Other athletes, their heart rate just goes up, up, up. Uh, and part of this is probably a function of fiber type and, you know, just some individual variation, but part of it is also a function of how they train. I'm going to hop over that. And, and finally, or just towards the end, I want to say that this is kind of the best way I know to visualize this idea is that most of your training sessions, maybe seven, eight out of 10, should land in a green bucket. They are sessions that you don't feel like you had to, you know, meet your maker uh, mentally to finish. They are sessions that are comfortable, relatively speaking, but you're doing the work. And then, uh, you know, another couple out of 10 are going to end up in one of these buckets, you know, a threshold session or a high intensity interval session. And the most likely thing you will do wrong will be this. You will let the easy sessions get too hard and then you won't be well recovered. And the, the sessions where you really want to have some quality they won't be as good as they should have been. And you land, you get this kind of intensity black hole. This is a very common mistake. And I would almost argue that it's more common in masters athletes than it is in elite performers. Because if you're training 25 hours a week, you just can't do this. But if you're training 10, you can, but it won't be very successful for you. I'm gonna hop over this, but <clears throat> Finally, it's when it comes to this idea of polarized training, what it often comes down to is doing quite a bit of work. It's somewhere around 65% of VO2 max, which might be, shouldn't be higher than say 70% of heart rate max. You know, a lot of workouts might even be lower, quite a bit lower than that, 60 to 70% of maximum heart rate. And then some of your workouts, those interval sessions, they don't necessarily want to be at 100%. You don't want to necessarily be going to max heart rate but you want to be collecting minutes at about 90%. And this has a good transfer. You know, you, you, yeah, you'll do some really tough race pace work, but you don't want to do it too much uh, because it's, it's not sustainable. It's tougher to recover from. And you get the adaptations in the zone four, you might say. You don't need to go to zone five too often. Um, this is just an athlete that she's all-time great uh, cross country skier, uh, all time winter Olympian in terms of medals won. Uh, her first gold medal was as a young athlete in 2005 in the world championships, but she was doing quite a lot of interval training. She was, uh, there was a Norwegian guru that was trying to get her to do more interval training than probably was normal in Norway. And it worked at first, but then, then, it, then she started to fall apart and her results got worse. And she considered retiring in 2009. And what she had to do was redistribute, calm down, go back to basics. She ended up dropping by about half the amount of interval training, increasing her overall volume a bit, and a bit more strength training. And during this five-year period, she was the most successful cross-country skier ever. 
uh, but she almost retired because the the distribution here was not sustainable for her it was too much high intensity work she wasn't recovering and she just wasn't able to mobilize when she needed to in races so it doesn't always look like a huge difference but but from a performance standpoint this was a night and day difference of getting that balance right and it also makes a difference for us normal uh, mortals as well so these are the big questions you want to answer when you're training and you're monitoring your own training a lot of you if you have a coach this is what your coach is asking in one way or another uh, and these are the basic questions that you want to answer for yourself and the way i think is a good way to do so uh, in rowing, it's tough to do it on the water, this, this pace and that, because it's a tough to have a very consistent conceptualization of what it actually means because of wind and waves and current and so forth, all those things we know. So we often have to use physiology and perception and, and, and maybe some erg calibration. But this trinity, these three approaches, some external feedback on what's the external pace or power, some physiology, whether it's heart rate or occasional blood lactate, probably for most of you, it will be heart rate. And then some of just saying, well, where am I on a scale of one to 10 for effort? This is this trinity or this triangulation gives us useful information here about how much is this costing me to do relative to what I'm achieving in speed or in watts. And if that relationship is getting out of hand, if it's getting too tough, then I need to change. I need to rest. I need to adjust. And so uh, this, this kind of triangulation is, one, is what we, over 25 years, have found to be about the only way to really get at this in an in a appropriate way. Because each of these methods by themselves, if you just base yourself on heart rate or just base yourself on watts or whatever on the ERG, you will make mistakes in your training. So I think with that, I will stop uh, and show you a picture from a fjord in Norway. And hopefully there's a bit of time. Looks like it's getting late, but if people want to ask me a question, they are welcome to. We're, we're, we're good here uh, in the States, but if you're willing to answer a couple of questions, we do have a few. Do you have a couple of minutes? Yeah, sure. Great. Okay. Um, so there are a couple that came in, especially towards the end. Um, why don't we start with, um, you know, the, you had that slide on the, about with, um, you know, we're not bulletproof. And uh, right. especially though, that was really interesting data with how rowers responded compared to other endurance athletes. And that was a good point to make about, you know, th that the ages were slightly different. Do, do you have any data um, about people who aren't endurance, like, you know, endurance athletes versus non-endurance athletes? I think we all want to believe that as we're continuing to train and work out that like, we're better off than people who aren't working out <laughs> and doing this yeah, kind well, of volume. <laughs> the, yeah, this is the... the... There are certain issues that there's been a kind of an epidemic of, of uh, arrhythmias and particularly what we call atrial fibrillation. Uh, I've had it many, many middle-aged men. It's almost been become kind of a, the, the disease of the middle-aged master's athlete. And it seems to be a bit more prevalent in men. Um, and, and there are questions of why is it, why is this happening? Are we doing too much high intensity work, too much total stress and so forth? So there are little pockets of uh, where training is not necessarily good for us. Uh, if we, you know, if we're going too hard, I, I had this, but I think what we all see with the master's athlete is it's not the training itself. It's the training on top of all the other stresses of life. Uh, and, and it just tips the balance too much. And, and so I can say in my case, I now train, I hit max heart rate regularly in races. I'm doing, I have no issues with arrhythmias, but for three years, I just had to quit doing interval training. I had to get my life back under control. I had to reduce stress level. Uh, and then, and then I kind of got healthy again. And now my heart is doing is performing well without these arrhythmias. But so, so in my case, it seems that it's not the training that was the problem. It was the training on top of a lot of unhealthy stress. Uh, so I think, you know, we have to remember that the, the human body, the autonomic nervous system, and that it really can't distinguish 
the stress of a divorce from the stress of an interval session or the stress of, you know, kids trying to get, get them paid, pay their college or, or a pandemic or all of these things, it all adds up. There's even research to show that, that uh, student athletes, when they have exams, they respond more poorly to training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I so remember when I was coaching in Virginia, I was coaching in Virginia and Kevin Sauer, head coach there, he felt that during exam week, that was, you know, we got to give him at least two workouts off. Like that, 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 yeah, that you just you got to adjust the total stress load. Yeah. Great. Awesome. We're going to shift gears a little bit. Got a couple of questions about strength training. And actually one of the questions that I wrote down at the beginning was there was a part, and if I misquoted you or I, I didn't understand this correctly, but let's start here. You know, you said that rowers typically strength train more. Do they need to train strength train more than other endurance athletes? Or is it just that we like to do it? Or it's, it's a great question. It, or, do, or is it in great? Like I remember Chris Korzanowski once said, you know, I strength train because I'm, a, I won't do the, his accent because I always do it poorly, but you know, if we strength train, cause I strength train because I'm afraid not to, <laughs> should we be doing more? Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I would argue that, that ultimately it's, it's, it's individual that meaning that there will be some athletes that have some weak link, you know, often if I generalize big time, because the anatomy says so that the female athlete, their upper body strength relative to their lower body strength will be lower so they will maybe benefit from strengthening that linkage between hips and 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 arms you know mm -hmm. maybe more than the guys because just the starting point will tend to be more problematic that but that but again it's individual and and i have met rowers that have said ah crikey no weights for me you know and they were world champions and yeah. then others of you know olaf tufta he did lots of strength training, lots he's of, a lumber lots jack. of he's out there. like Yeah. I mean, he, he, he looks like, you know, the farmer Joe, you know, and so he believed in doing all that heavy duty strength training. Uh, did it work? <laughs> you know, at his best, it seemed to be, he, he had, he had a good, you know, pretty good anaerobic power and so forth. But the point is, I don't think there is a, uh, a, a, um, a clear research basis to say everybody should strength train if they're a rower and so i think this answers the uh, next the question. only thing i will say is yeah just that the the peak forces in rowing are probably a bit higher than some of the peak forces in other endurance activities in other words you're you're you've got a longer recovery phase but you also got a higher peak force so that would be some argument for strength training Okay. Yeah. And so I think this, and so then in terms of like what type of strength training to be doing, we have a great question here about, you know, would you recommend more explosive type workout strength training workouts, you know, box jumpies, yeah. you know, things like that, or is right. you know, more static movements, you know, what, and yeah. then, that, then we get into, oh, should it be more flexibility based training versus, you know, max power type right. lifting? What are your recommendations there in terms of what should be doing? For well, all right. I'm gonna, there's, there's two different ways to think about this, it, it, but I'm going to think uh, about it from the perspective of the fact that a lot of the people I'm talking to right now are my age and older, and we need strength training independent of the rowing. Okay. I strength train two days a week, not to be a better cyclist, but to be a healthier human because I know that I'm sitting on a bike eight, 10 hours a week, and I am only using my body in a very specific position. So when I go in the weight room, I try to do a lot of the opposite of whatever I'm doing on the, in the endurance capacity, because I need to extend my body. I need to lengthen. I need to do some jumps and some various movements that I'm not doing in that repetitive movement of cycling. I would argue the same in rowing. For our, you know, if you're a 60 year old rower, you need to do strength training, not to be a better rower, but to stay healthy. And if you stay healthy, you can row more. But does that make sense? You know, so yeah. So what I'm taking from this, and please, people, feel free to jump in in the chat. You know, I'm just one, you know, one person that can speak here. But is that you know there are gaps in rowing that we don't train. There are things that don't get worked as much, and if and but they support rowing in a lot. Oh of yeah. Ways. And if we're not, and so you're saying in the weight room, those are the areas you want to focus on to be a well-rounded human 
as opposed to just like, oh, I, in rowing, I work, you know, we work our lats a lot. We work our quads a lot. That that's the yeah, only yeah. thing that should be training is not true. Yeah, and, 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 and that probably has relatively little impact on your thousand meter time, to be honest, <laughs> you know, <laughs> relatively little. But if you're not getting, for example, bone loading, then that's not good for your bones, you know, because we, we know that the bones for the maintain bone density, you need some, some ballistic work. If you're not stretching out, then you start getting, you develop short syndromes. Some of the muscles shorten up relative to others. And then you get in, you, you start asking for other kinds of injuries. So there's lots of reasons why you go into the weight room almost to kind of undo some of the movement habits of rowing, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, no, I think that definitely makes sense. And then you, there, were, I think that kind of answers one of the other questions that we had over here, where it's, you know, should we be doing 80, 20, you know, 80 to 20 in the weight room as well when we're, when we're structuring our training there? Yeah, it, well, it depends on what you mean. 80% well, of what? Or 80%? Yeah, exactly. Well, I guess I think that's from an intensity standpoint, like 80% of strength yeah. should be, you know, more at that, not quite as intense and 20%. You know, it's, it's yeah. a good, it's a good question. And, and, and to be honest, a lot of, if, if you start digging into a lot of sports, everything from MMA to, to endurance sports, to sprinting, we do see that it's very similar in the sense that even sprinters, they can't sprint full speed very often. Mm -hmm. So most of their training is at say 92% of max velocity, which for them is low intensity. It's green zone right? And they don't get hurt, but they get good mechanics. And the same thing in the weight room is that, you know, if you bring your rep counts up to say 10 and you bring your intensity down, then you're less likely to get hurt, but you get a nice hyper hypertrophy effect. Uh, and then you do some of the really high intensity stuff. But uh, I would say that's what we see at our age, at my age and, and older is that it, you want to, again, think what's going to be sustainable what, you know, I'm, I'm considering what, I, how do I do this in a way that I'm going to be able to train the most number of times in a year and feel and have good sessions. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah. if you're pulling, if, if, if you have that as a basic criteria, then you have risk, you're thinking ri relative risk for different things you do and say, what's, you know, I can, yeah, I can throw on another 20 kilos, but what's the chances that this is going to hurt that back problem I have a tendency to get, you know, I think I'll do more reps at a little bit lower weight or, you know? explosive and then I'm good to go if tomorrow. You're not used to doing explosive movements, maybe a box integrating a box jump isn't a good place. Uh, to go. <laughs> no, but, but, and, and the other thing is start easy. Don't think you're 18, you it's know, because nice. a lot of us have, yeah, just start you know, uh, like an, a great exercise is standing is, is repeat standing broad jumps, right? Mm -hmm. Just double, double leg, boom, like a, just rabbit jumping, you know, but start, you know, start kind of 50% load and then slowly increase, but, but do it over a bit of time, clap yourself on the back and say, Oh man, it's been a long time since I did that. Mm -hmm. You know, that wasn't too bad. You know, I was only going one meter per hop. But then next time I'm going to stretch it a bit, you know, and, and so it, it can get better pretty quickly, but it can also injure you immediately if you go too hard the first day. So just try to be a bit patient, give yourself three or four sessions to work into some of these jump type movements. Great. Awesome. Well, you mentioned recovery a second ago, and I know there was that great part in your presentation where you were talking about, you know, distribution of workouts and how often are we doing the intensity and, you know, because we need more time to recover as we get older. Um, is there anything, this is a question from the chat, is there anything that we can do to help along the recovery? And I know, you know, when, especially when training like elite level athletes, you know, there's whether it's the Norma Techs, the ice baths, the, the things that people, yeah. you know, um, oh gosh, there, there've been so many, you know, oh, rub this cream. This will, right. will help your, your well, lactic acid right. you know, get out. Anything that you recommend? I, here's the thing. Mother nature is pretty clever. And so a lot of the, these negative things that are happening that we're trying to avoid with the creams and the, this and that we need them because they signal adaptation. So what research has shown, for example, ice baths, sounds great get in the ice bed and you, you cool down everything. Well, it feels good, but it ends up reducing adaptive effects to training. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, if you're in the heat of the battle and you've got three competitions in a row on three days, you might use an ice bath to get through the competitions. You might do that. But if you're training over a six week period, you're not going to do an ice bath every day because it will literally block adaptations. You, the body needs some of that inflammatory response to yeah. signal adaptation. So we have to be, we have to have two thoughts in our head at the same time. Yeah. If that makes sense is what's the situation. Am I in the heat of battle? And I need, I'm going to take some NSAIDs or whatever, because I've got some inf inflammation. That's okay. But don't take NSAIDs, you know, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Don't take those every workout because you think that's going to make you better. It'll make you worse. Because mm -hmm. then the body won't that's, make the adaptations. To yeah, it. that's what the later. research has shown mm -hmm. for vitamin C, vitamin E, NSAIDs, ice baths, all these things that we try to do, they end up actually uh, blunting the adaptive signal. Mm -hmm. Awesome. No, totally makes sense. That's great. That's awesome. Um, well, I think that that, you know, there, I think I combined a couple of the questions that people had. Um, I am going to ask, I would like to close with one that I wrote down within the first like minute of your, <laughs> of your presentation. And that's, uh, how'd you break your ribs? What did you do? Oh, oh man, uh, it's almost embarrassing, but I use kettlebells quite a bit uh -huh. and I've used them for years and years. And I often do push-ups where I'm kind of up on top of the kettlebells. And um, during the pandemic, I'm training at home. And one night in March last year, just one of the kettlebells just, just flipped over. And my head was saying, oh, don't hurt your wrist. So I was thinking about my wrist, but it put me in an awkward position. And I, land, I just fell straight down onto an iron ball. And it just, my ribs, I just heard it just snap, you know, just crack. <laughs> you know, oh. I thought, holy shit, I just broke my ribs, you know. Oh, I'm <laughs> it sorry was not fun. That. I can, I can, I can, don't do it if you can avoid it. And, uh, it's a uh, rib bre breaking ribs is one of the most painful thing. Cause you can't sleep. You can't lay down. It, it just, and I don't can you strongly, dare don't you dare sneeze. No. Oh, I did. I sneezed one time after 10 days, I almost passed out. Yeah. So, uh, it's, <laughs> don't be stupid and fall down on a kettlebell. Awesome. Okay. Well, I just, for my own curiosity as someone who like frequently uh, falls on my bike, <laughs> As you can see. <laughs> no, I, it was it was the most freaky accident. But anyway, so I, I have been mentally challenged to use the kettlebells ever since. All right. Well, wonderful. Great. I mean, this was amazing. It was so informative. We're really excited to post on the website. Um, everyone that's attending, like, please, I put a survey in the link. It is two and a half questions. The second, the third one is optional. Would love some feedback on, you know, for, for us and for Dr. Seiler on what you thought of this. And also things you want to hear on for masters in the future, please fill it out. Um, I know I was getting lots of comments in the chat, Dr. Seiler, about how great this was. I got a text from my former teammate, Lindsay Dare Shoop, who uh, is an Olympic gold medalist and said, you are speaking her language. She's going to be here at camp next week, helping with our elite athletes. Um, so we're super excited about that. And thank you so Fantastic. much for taking your time on a Saturday well, night it, with us. 